Perfect. So um, thanks again, everybody, for sharing your time. For those of you that we met on Thursday, again, I'm Melissa Palia. I'm the um, Eastern Massachusetts support person for Permobile. Um, and Heather Sanciolo is our um, Eastern, our Northeastern regional educator. Um, and we are here today to help uh, share some knowledge and information and have a great discussion with you guys. So thanks for um, sharing this uh, precious time with us and inviting us into your space. Um, for a quick background, I'm a physical therapist. Heather's an OT, so we're here today really just to talk about um, concepts and things focused on manual wheelchair configuration. Um, whatever you guys want for questions and conversations, feel free to um, ask questions as we go um, or put questions in the chat box. And then if I know um, a question's about to be answered, I'll let it go or I'll, I'll reply while Heather's kind of given us our, our presentation. Yeah, yeah. Great, so I just wanna introduce myself and then I'm gonna probably turn off my camera so I can share my screen. Um, just a little bit of background, like Melissa said, I'm an OT. I started my career um, working at the Kessler Institute down in New Jersey. Um, don't hold it against me, but I'm a Jersey girl. And uh, from worked there for many years in an acute rehab setting, um, specializing in spinal cord injury treatment. Um, from there is really where I realized how much I loved equipment and especially wheelchairs. So I ran their wheelchair clinic for a number of years. Um, at one point I met my husband and moved to Rhode Island and started working at a rehab hospital in Providence. Um, I was there for over 20 years. We started a wheelchair clinic that ran until I left, which was November of 2020. Um, so I've had a lot of clinical background, um, working mostly with adults, but um, of all different backgrounds and working with a lot of different types of, of mobility equipment. Um, so let me share my screen. Uh, let's see if I can find my PowerPoint. Okay, I'm gonna share this. And let me get into my slideshow. Okay, so today, as we said, we're gonna be talking about wheelchair configuration. Um, today, you might find that some of the information is, actually, I was gonna stop sharing my, um, camera, but I have it on. Um, so I think you'll find some of the information maybe a little technical. So please feel free to jump in. Um, I always hope that during presentations, there's something that you'll learn from it and something I can learn from you. So please feel free to uh, throw out questions and um, you know help have a discussion. So Melissa and I are here today. Um, part of what I always bring up is that in the last 15 to 20 years, there's been quite a bit of research on wheelchair configuration and how it affects the user, both functionally, medically. Um, and I thought this article is actually, Rai Chavez and Associates was really very appropriate. And I wanted to bring it into the discussion because in this study they found, which was, um, completed about 200 spinal cord injured um, people. And what they found was one of the most commonly limiting factors was their wheelchair, which I found pretty amazing because here's the piece of equipment that's supposed to be giving them the freedom and ability to function, but yet it was actually preventing them from doing more. So I thought it was really interesting because it really brings back to the center of our discussion that the most important way to get a good match and a good configuration is having that end user be the center. So I really like to stress that. Um, part of the importance of configuration goes through a, a bunch of different reasons. As you can see here, there's significant research out there to support and give evidence as to why one wheelchair and is not the same for everyone. Um, when we talk about optimal fit, it has a great implication as to then how you can function. Um, again, an improper fit, like it says here, can increase pain. Um, it can lead to poor posture because of someone compensating or not fitting properly. Um, it's going to affect how they propel if it's not fit appropriately. Um, looking at optimal stability, as you can see here, obviously having a good base and support is going to enable someone to use their upper extremities to do more. Um, and maybe that's something in the home, maybe it's childcare, maybe it's 
being able to complete your daily living skills and get dressed. So the optimal configuration of being stable in that base and seat is really important for the user. Um, optimal performance. When we talk about optimal performance, we're looking at what's safe, what's effective. Ergonomically, are we positioned well in our seat and our wheel and our chair frame so that we can propel and push efficiently? Um, so that's a real important part as to, obviously when we propel, we wanna be the most efficient to have less stress on our joints and obviously less fatigue and overall um, complications as, we, as many um, experience over the years of using a chair. Um, I love this slide be just because it's um, by Lang and Minkel, who are two um, highly regarded clinicians who are still practicing and have done a, quite a bit of research um, on wheelchair measurements and what's a, a well-configured chair. Um, but I really think it brings home the important part that it's about the individual and getting those exact measurements is really important. The chair is an extension of the user. Um, you know, and they say, you know, it's like a prosthetic. Um, you wouldn't give just a pros any prosthesis to any person. It's custom fitted. And the wheelchair is really, again, extension of that person to maximize what they can do every day and how they feel and, and function and what they wanna do every day in that chair, not just a to and from piece of equipment. Um, so one size does not fit all. I always think in a lot of situations, people go into Walmart or a store and they see the, the wheelchairs that are in the front of the store and those serve a purpose. Um, however, that's not what someone who's in a chair, you know, 12, 15 hours a day, every day of the year is going to be able to function, perform and feel good um, and not have complications. So again, today what we're focusing on is that highly configured ultra lightweight wheelchair um, that has all the parts, not only the frame, the wheels, the casters, but everything catered to that individual and how they're gonna use it. So I love this one, a little skeleton for fun, but um, you know, again, the shoulders connected too. So bringing back home, the fact that the end user needs to be at the center, everything's connected, everything works together. So not only are we talking about the body, but we're talking about, again, the extension of the chair and everything needs to work together to be safe, to be effective um, and have the best outcome. Um, you know, to sit someone in a chair without a purpose, um, to me, means nothing. Um, so again, we really wanna take in that whole person and make sure that they're the center of what's being decided on. Um, why it matters. Again, we've been talking about the research and what there's a lot of support and evidence as to why one wheelchair doesn't fit all. Um, it's very important, the impact that they found of using a well-configured wheelchair as to particularly shoulder health. Um, there's multiple studies out there at this point, and I don't know how many of you have felt this, but the repetitive strain injury or overuse syndrome is very common in the spinal cord population. Um, and in this study, they were showing that up to 73% reported pain, um, which is obviously significant and it, it is going to limit function and what you can do during the day. So it's real important, again, our evidence and support to get a well-configured chair. That's the why. Um, and the shoulder being one of the most commonly reported um, areas of injury. Um, you know, how does this shoulder affect, you know, someone may say, well, it's just a shoulder, like you're using your arms, your, you know, your trunk. It's true. However, when you think about where that, where you're generating that function to propel, it's obviously from the shoulder, the arm and the hand. So depending upon your level of injury, how you're gonna use and propel that chair is gonna be imperative when you're doing that fitting. Um, you know, again, the effects of pain and injury, it's going to affect how you propel, how much you can propel. Um, it's going to affect your positioning. If for some reason one shoulder is hurting more than another, you may lean or try to compensate. 
Um, the other thing is the technique. You know, you may end up using a different way of pushing, which ultimately may put back strain or neck strain or head positioning that's, again, not optimal for prolonged use during throughout the day to do the things you need to do. Um, the other area of injury that we can all comment on is transfers um, and completing those ADLs, those daily living tasks. Um, you know, if your shoulder is injured or in pain, trying to lift it up to maybe do cooking on the stove or lift a child for childcare, or even just getting dressed is really going to impact the level of assistance you may need and ultimately affect your condition down the road and ability to be functional. Again, we're always looking to promote and keep people up and active as much as you wanna be. And that the chair should help support that. This slide is, is actually from the, uh, it's actually from a study that was done and it shows how everything is connected and basically looking at, let's say a body function, like we were talking about pain or, or shoulder injury, how it is going to affect everything else you do. It's all connected. So again, as we were saying, the pain and shoulder injury may affect how you're gonna be able to dress yourself if you can still do it independently or do you need help from someone else? Um, maybe also because you can't get dressed quickly, now is it gonna affect taking your kids to school? Is maybe going to work? Um, maybe getting out of the house to meet friends. So it's going to affect those life roles and activities that you really want to enjoy. Um, and so again, this well-configured chair needs to be taken a look at closely for that end user to make sure that all of these areas are working together. So this is now we get into the fun stuff. How do we configure the optimal ride? Um, so we're gonna discuss different actual parts of the chair um, as we get into the next few slides. And we'll have examples of, again, a good fit, a, a better fit, and sort of the best fit, um, and how you sort of measure for that and, and how you make that happen in your chair. Um, I just wanted to bring up this because I thought it was so important, and I'm sort of curious to see if you guys agree with this. But this was actually a survey done um, for clinicians and ATPs. Um, there were 400 that were polled and as well as with end users with research. And basically what they looked at is what were the most important, five most important factors when choosing your wheelchair. Um, and I thought this was, I would agree with this. Um, again, which one's in first or second? I think that depends on the individual. But I thought it was definitely worth mentioning and showing that there is um, agreement amongst clinicians, suppliers, and I believe end users as to why you need this highly configured ultra lightweight wheelchair with those custom parts. Um, as, if we look here, the green one, configuration options. Um, if we look at the red, we're looking at adjustability of the frame and parts. Um, if we're looking at the blue, we're looking at maneuverability. The pink or purple being durability. We obviously want something that you're investing in that's gonna hold up over time with heavy use. And weight. Um, as we know with, I would think everyone who's been in a chair or tried a chair or even um, family members, obviously the heavier the wheelchair, the more work it is for the person propelling and maneuvering it and sitting in it all day, but also for those caregivers who may be helping to transport or you know, in times that someone's tired helping to assist. So again, I think these are all very applicable um, and I'm curious to see if, if everyone agrees. So shoot Melissa a little note in the chat box. So how do we go from here, which is again, taking very specific measurements of the individual. Um, this is usually done during that evaluation and assessment process. Um, hopefully all of you have been through or been with clinicians that have really identified these key 
points of what we call the body or anatomical um, parts um, so that they can actually really hone in and get this highly configured chair. Um, you know, when you look at these two slides, you say, wow, like this is a CAD drawing and it's so detailed. There's so many measurements. Like, is, how do we get from doing body measurements to this actual chair? Do you have to be an engineer? No, but you do need to keep that end user in the center of that evaluation and be asking a lot of questions and taking measurements. And again, coming up with those specifics so that the end result is this highly configured chair. Um, and again, going to clinicians, clinics, um, areas that have a specialty is probably gonna be in your best interest because these are the people that do this all the time and understand the complexity of not only the person, but the equipment. Um, today, we're gonna to take a, a look at these five and even a sixth aspect of the chair, which I think are so important when you get into the custom manual wheelchair line, which I presume all of you are in as you should be when you've been a user and using a chair throughout the day. Um, so we're gonna be looking at seat width, the seat depth, back support, seat to floor height, and the last one being center of gravity. So as you can see in the pictures here, which we'll go into more specifics, but the little blue lines here are actually showing what we're talking about. And we'll go through each one individually. So seat width. When we talk about seat width, when you're going through the process of evaluation and assessment, Someone is obviously going to take in consideration what we call the anatomical measurement or the, the, measure, the actual measurements of your body. When we're looking at seat width, as you can see here with the blue lines, we're looking at the widest part, usually along the, the hip and sort of um, side area of the thigh um, to take that into an actual measurement and then translate that into, okay, how do we measure the actual wheelchair? Um, and I think most people would agree in the industry that the important part is to make sure that it's a custom fit according to the person's measurements and then how they want to fit in that chair. So again, I, I say, it, which I'll say throughout this whole presentation, the trial process, and again, keeping you as the end user in the center to really hone in on what is important um, for width for you. Um, but again, we know width of the chair is going to work better and have less um, limiting factors if we can keep it closer or tighter to your actual measurements, hip measurements. Part of that reason being is if you look at this actual picture, this is a before and after. Again, the chair on the left is a good chair. And she's been functioning in that um, for quite a while. Um, however, when you compare it to the chair on the right, you can see that it is a better fit. And when you look at hip width measurements, this one again, it's not, I, you know, again, it fits her, but you can see how much wider and how much more room is between sort of her hip or the end of the cushion or the side of the cushion here to where her wheel and rim is you can see how much wider the back is and how much further she has to extend both arms out to reach that rim and wheel. Um, so whereas you can compare to the chair on the right side, that is really, again, tailored. The rim and wheel is in closer. She has brought the width of the chair in to really fit her measurements. And again, it's going to increase her likelihood of improving and being a propeller for many years to decrease the wear and tear in those shoulders. Because um, obviously the further out you have to reach and push, it's going to obviously impact the wear and tear on your upper body. Um, the other aspect, just functionally speaking, is it's gonna make a huge difference when you're turning, going through doorways. I mean, you can see there's this, she has some camber, the wheels are a little flared. Um, however, this chair on the right is going to be a lot easier to get through tight areas and turns than the chair on the left. So again, the overall measurements are bringing that tighter. And on the right-hand side, you see really more of her than you do of the chair. 
which I think most of us would agree would be a good thing. Um, I bring up this picture because I think it's so important that no matter what your size, no matter what your age, no matter what your disability, um, the chair is such an important part of you and an extension that you want to be able to see the person, whether it's someone who's young and a pediatric or you know a young child or someone who's an adult. As you can see in this picture, you see this young girl, you obviously see the chair, but the chair is fit to her. You can see the width um, and again, how comfortable she seems to be sitting and how mobile. Um, so again, seeing more of her than the chair, but fit very nicely between on that hip there. Um, so when we look at these functional considerations, we've been talking a little bit about that when we were looking at those pictures and looking at sort of before and after. Um, and we call this sort of the Goldilocks of, of fitting of wheelchairs. There, I will say that there's never one way is the best way, however, because it's based on the individual. However, there has been research and ways to suggest that certain setups and widths are going to benefit you in the long term. If something's too narrow and it's too tight on your hips or thigh area, you may experience discomfort. You may get pressure, which could increase the risk of skin injuries or some type of abrasion. Um, so it's, again, it could be a negative. Um, if it's too wide, it can obviously have too much room. You may be sliding from side to side. You may not sit on your cushion appropriately. And then therefore you may develop a postural asymmetry or some type of pressure injury from not sitting appropriately in your chair on your cushion. Um, you may then end up pushing unevenly. So the wear and tear in your upper body and joints are gonna be neg negatively impacted. Um, also, as we were saying with the other chairs, if it's too wide, granted what is too wide for that individual, but the wider it is, is going to impact how it fits in certain environments, getting through doorways, getting on a ramp, um, getting into a van. So again, um, it decreases that environmental access, the wider the chair is. Um, just right, whoops, ah, just right. So what we try for, and again, what the research helps to support is keeping a seat width as narrow as possible to fit that individual. So looking at those measurements and considering that. Um, you obviously want to keep, like we were saying, the hip width measurement as close as possible because then where that wheel is gonna come off the side of that frame is gonna be in a better position for those shoulders and arms, which we know have a big impact for long-term use um, and possible injury. Looking at um, seat taper. So this is one, you can see the little blue line. And what I wanna make a comment on, it's sort of difficult to see a little bit in this diagram, is that this is a view looking down on the top of the wheelchair. So this is actually the whole seat frame. And what this blue line is showing you here is actually how the front of the seat frame is tapered or closer in than the back. And again, some people prefer to have a tapered seat, some people don't. Um, why would you do that? Um, partly because some people are narrower and when they sit from their hips to their sort of knee area tends to come in. Um, and if that's the case, you can then taper the seat to match more of your alignment of your lower leg and hip area. Um, it also obviously is bringing in the front of frame of the chair and therefore it can get closer to objects. It may help with transfers. Um, your turning, your footprint is gonna be smaller because the front of your chair is narrower. Um, and again, you're gonna see a little bit more of the person than the chair. There's nothing wrong with not having seat taper as some people need to have a little extra but I'll say um, chair frame here um, for maybe setting up a slide board for a transfer, um, maybe increased, um, they may have a little edema or swelling or maybe a little extra um, tissue by their lower leg and knee area. So having a tapered frame won't fit them. 
Um, so it really depends on that individual. But again, if we're trying to get it to match the person's body, this is an option. Hey, Heather. Yeah. Oh, wait, I'm sorry. There's a picture next, isn't there? Yes. So right. this I picture, yep, is <laughs> I, I put these two in here just because, and I, you can see the little scribbly, but yellow lines here. But what I wanted to show was this picture on the left. This is not a tapered frame. So the back of the frame and the front of the frame on the seat are the same width measurement. As you can see, her legs do come in. The hips are wider and where the knees are is narrower. She could have done a narrower chair, but when we talk about seat, depth, seat taper, this one is not tapered, it's just straight. So you can see there's extra room here sort of on the side from where her leg is positioned. On the one on the right, this one's actually tapered. And what it's showing is there's really not a lot of extra because the chair is matching the width of the back and the front to her hips and to her like front leg area. Um, so that again, is a tighter fit. Did you want to share something, Melissa, on the? Um, yeah, we had a quick question. That was a great question. And I just want to make sure I've answered it um, or there's any more questions about it. Um, a question was about, um, for going back just one step to the hip width, um, yeah. you know, the skeleton and trochanter to trochanter versus accommodating for hip width uh, or mm -hmm. a kind of flesh. And I think that's, um, that's honestly the trickiest part. And I think it, different clinics, different clinicians, different therapists um, or ATPs will, people will sometimes have different opinions here, but ultimately the conversations that kind of look at it are um, how much can, you know, the soft tissue can be compressed sometimes and it kind of body to body soft tissue kind of responds differently. Mm -hmm. And so if, if the soft tissue can be, I don't want to say squeeze like pressure, but kind of compressed a little bit and you personally fit comfortably there. Yeah. Um, it's, some people may kind of do a, a, a tighter, a slimmer squeeze, if you will. But then we have to look at, does that person have sensation in that area? Um, do they have a history of breakdown? Do they need more space? And so sometimes it's really helpful um, to sit in a chair. I'll just say, like, say someone says, let's try 18 wide, see what a 17 wide looks like or feels like to determine if that is a, an appropriate fit for you. Mm -hmm. Great, thanks. Um, oh, and then one more question. I'll pause. Um, great question about seat taper. Um, what about cushions for a tapered seat? You want to have any comments on that, Heather? Sure. So obviously, if you're tapering the seat frame, it would be best to have a cushion that matches that. Some are going to be easier to taper than others. Um, and again, taking that measurement and where that sort of seat frame ends, um, will come into play, but again, it really depends on the individual, but most of the time you want to have a cushion that can match that. And I think, um, sometimes ones that have kind of thicker, um, like depending on a foam, I've seen some dealers even just trim the front edge mm -hmm. a little bit. Sometimes mm -hmm. air is just a nice one because it will fit kind of comfortably in that area. Yeah. Um, cushions that I think are thicker or more dense in the front. Um, and really hold a very rigid shape that hold and provide really uh, particular thigh support, maybe aren't always the right fit with a seat, with a tapered seat. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, and those may, be the, yeah, those may be the decisions that you're making then whether you do taper or don't taper. Yeah, great. Um, one question is, is this yeah. standard or what would be the reason to not do it? A, a lot of people might not know to ask for a tapered front and, and you're absolutely right. Mm -hmm. People, um, don't know about it. And so one, that's partly why we love to share this education. Um, seat taper, um, I, I can't speak for other, other manufacturers, but I can tell you that it is an option that's available um, on any tie light chair. And so um, it's, a, it's, I don't know that it's often something brought up, particularly on initial chair avails or even second chair avails. Um, and sometimes it does come down to having someone consider it or you guys advocating and, and asking for it. Um, so it's, it's, it's not a default measurement, but it is something that absolutely can be, can be achieved. Yeah. Again, if you're sort of dialing this chair in, um, again, it's something to talk about. So it's nice. If it's something you didn't know about, it's, it's nice that you know about it now. And Heather, there's one more question. Um, how does a tapered chair affect a transfer positively or negatively, especially with getting over the frame? You want to comment on that? Sure. Um, again, depending on how you transfer, a tapered frame is going to have, it's not gonna be squared off. It's gonna come in a little bit more. So again, making sure that if you, you're thinking about a tapered frame, 
you know, how do you transfer? Do you shift forward? Um, do you have to sit on or have a board on that sort of edge of the cushion to support yourself to go to another surface? Um, so there is what I'll say less surface area. So if you're transferring, you do have to make sure that you can um, clear that little extra space and that you don't need it for that added support when you're sort of shifting forward and, and maybe doing a lateral transfer. Um, but it really depends on the individual. Some people, it, it doesn't, those that maybe inch um, less on each side may not impact them at all. And they can just sort of, you know, come right over it and it's not impact, but some people need that extra, extra edge to sort of help support them, if that helps answer. Um. There's, um, I'm gonna, I'll hold on the comment from Abby about um, seat width and just kind of wrap, finish up this taper conversation. Um, sure. Pamela asks, is there um, degrees of tapered offered? Um, and so just to kind of remind everybody, since we've got our picture that is on right now is the front end taper, um, but we're talking about the um, seat taper is the current conversation. Yeah, thanks Heather. Yeah. Yeah. Um, and so the, um, it's not measured by degree, it's actually measured, it's a custom measurement that in the evaluation, the therapist or the ATP or myself would assist with um, looking at you individually and deciding, okay, how wide, you know, what's your hip weather, hip measurement, so the back end of the chair, um, and then towards the front end, how much, what's that difference between your kind of, we'll call it knee width to hip width. And so we measure it and say, okay, let's taper it in two inches or something like that. It's, it's not, um, we, we customize it for you for that reason. Thank you. Yep. Uh, and Great. then there's one last comment. Um, yeah. Sorry, I'm going to swing it back and feel free if anyone no. wants to come off mute to kind of comment on here, um, or if this is working with chat, feel free. But uh, one question going back, Abby comments about the seat list, which I think is yeah. a, a great question. Um, you know, there's a kind of a comment. I'm curious if a lot of you guys think that the common reason um, the first wheelchair tends to be too wide and it's just a, a caution or people um, are people create uh, worried about creating pressure injuries um, and then leaving room for transfers. And I think that first chair is tricky. And there's, I would say just professionally across the industry, I think people have a lot of different opinions about that. And then unfortunately there is often a, a conversation of when someone's newly injured, um, how do we accommodate for how your body's going to change as your body's adjusting to being newly injured? And then what is that weight, um, you know, as weight fluctuates during that time frame? Um, it's, it's, it's such a challenging conversation. And so it's really helpful to know, um, to know these options and look at, you know, you certainly don't want to say your first chair is not a good one and your second one's where we dial it in, but that often does um, just change a little bit. And one thing that's nice to know, um, we have the ability to, if we measure, say a 17 wide chair, and then someone ends up needing a little wider, we can actually space out your side guards we can space out your wheels if someone needed say a half inch more or an inch more space. So without getting a new frame, because we all know you can't get a new frame in a year or two years or something like that, that we can actually make minor adjustments so that while the frame stays the same width, we're allowing more space for your soft tissue to spread. Um, so I hope, I hope that's a good kind of thought there. I think yeah. I'll, I'll let you jump back over. Great. Well put. So I think we'll move into just to make sure we get through everything, but um, the footrest width. So now, again, the measurement for the footrest width is we're looking at the front of the frame of the chair. And this is a rigid chair. So what my little blue line is showing is sort of calf level. Um, but basically, the measurement between these two pieces or bars, I'll say, of the frame. Um, and in some instances, some people will do it, again, more tapered or a V or just straight down from that seat frame. Um, but again, and I'll show you some pictures of that actually coming up. Um, but one of the reasons why you may or may not do that is obviously, again, sort of like the seat taper, it brings, if you want your legs and the chair to sort of match, if your legs are in a little tighter, um, to keep that body presentation um, and shape more custom to your body shape. It'll also decrease the overall footprint so the, again, front of the frame is gonna be a little smaller and tighter. So again, turning, getting closer to surfaces, um, it tends to be easier. Um, so let me show you the next picture will actually show us different types of front ends, um, which actually you can see, this is a no taper on the left. And basically what it's showing is from the front of the seat frame, 
the angle comes down straight. It's not coming in. So there's no taper in the front area of this footrest. This one is showing a two inch taper. So there's a two inches that it's coming in. Generally, it's gonna be even. So let's say an inch on each side from where that, from the top of where that um, frame started. This one's showing a four inch. So you can see as we go from left to right, it becomes more significant. It really ends up being, again, the end user's um, preference. And depending again, whether it's a new injury, whether you've been in a chair for a while, you may have very strong feelings as a clinician about which way to go. Um, obviously the no taper is gonna give you the most room between the frame from sort of that knee area to the foot and ankle. Um, so it just depends, but again, you can see on the one on the left, how much more space you need to turn this front end than one with the tapered or even the V front. Um, so it is significant in that sense, but again, it, it needs to be for the individual and match the individual. Um, and again, performance and again, body shape. Um, some people may not do a taper because they tend to find that their legs are maybe a little larger, they're a larger body, and they're afraid of maybe legs hitting on the side. Um, so in that situation, you may go with no taper or maybe a smaller two inch taper. Um, to make sure that there's still enough room so that your legs aren't hitting the side, which could cause abrasions, maybe um, again, a pressure ulcer, depending if again, how much they're leaning on it. Um, so again, depends on the individual, but there are many options out there for again, how, how much you wanna bring that in. Um, getting into our seat depth. So there's two measurements that I think a lot of times people confuse. One is the, the seat depth, or we'll call it the, the seat sling, and then the um, frame length. So this one is showing you with the red line, the measurement of behind sort of the buttocks and hip area to the bend of the knee, which is typically what you're gonna do during the evaluation. And then when you're actually looking at the wheelchair with the blue line, it's going to, uh, show you basically the seat sling. And that's what we consider that seat depth. Um, so this measurement is very important because as we go and talk about it a little further, if it's too long and someone has their knee bent, depending on that angle, we wanna make sure that they're not cutting into the back of this. So that measurement is really important for the sling or the seat that you're sitting on and cushion, as well as we'll see the, the actual frame. So this measurement of that the, of the person is gonna be used for both the seat sling or seat depth as well as the frame depth. So as we are going into here, so what's the difference? The frame depth here is showing with this blue line, how it actually moves and extends past that seat sling or cushion length. And why do you do that? It's to match again, that whole length of the individual from their most backside part to that knee bend. And the reason for that is that it helps to distribute that weight over the frame better depending on where you put that wheel, but better so that you don't feel like you're going to tip or fall forward. So that's some of the benefits and differences. It is um, only able to do that on a chair that again is highly customizable um, and one of these, again, ultralight wheelchairs. Um, So this, what I like about this is this slide helps to, to talk about, again, why is seat depth and frame depth so important? And again, we're looking at trying to keep the weight distributed evenly from back to front um, to improve performance. Obviously, as you can see here with these two blue lines, it's showing that her seat depth match where her cushion and sling are, are further back than where her frame depth is. And again, the reason being, if you look where her knee bend is, 
that's where that frame bend is starting. So this extra frame here is helping to make sure that weight is distributed well so that the weight isn't constantly over those front casters and the chair isn't tipping forward. And it's particularly important when you start to do transfers and you're shifting your weight a little more forward to get out of the seat, you'll even find that this measurement makes a huge difference. Same thing as when you're rolling, say you're on cobblestones, um, uneven surfaces and um, maybe a sidewalk that's broken up. Again, to have that, that real customized frame. Now, some people don't need much here between the, the seat sling and the frame, or if any, depending again on their measurements. Um, but you will find on uneven surfaces, outdoors, that again, because the weight's being distributed better and more evenly, you're gonna get better rolling on your front caster and wheel. Um, and it's not gonna be getting caught and you'll be able to maneuver over, um, even do like little wheelies a lot better if it's distributed better. So hopefully that, that makes sense. Um, again, some of the considerations when we talk about the Goldilocks of, you know, what is the right sling depth? Um, it really depends on the individual, but again, if it's too long, and again, that sling or that seat cushion is too long, it can put pressure behind the knee. Um, it can also, because it's so long, in order for someone to get their legs in the right position and around that cushion, they may tend to slide forward. And again, that's not gonna be a good posture because now you're rounded, you're leaning forward, your shoulders are forward. Um, you're not getting that support that you need for your trunk. Um, and again, you can obviously, it can affect your skin if you're constantly sliding and not sitting in the cushion and the chair properly and have to constantly reposition. Um, if it's too short, obviously if it's too short, then your, your frame length and your, how much weight's on your caster and how much pressure is um, on your buttocks and not being sort of pushed along your, your leg and your femur um, is going to be, again, might increase those pressure points and you may feel unstable, you may get skin breakdown, um, or, or you may feel like you're just, there's not enough seat and you feel like you're gonna slide out and fall. Um, so again, that can be sometimes a cause of too short. What's just right? You know, how, how should someone really measure for this? For seat depth, again, for that cushion and seat sling, we usually will measure the body and then minus two inches. And why do you do that? Because we, again, most people sit and they bring their legs sort of at a knee bend where they're gonna get support, but also so that that hamstring and all of those muscles don't get overstretched. So two inches generally tends to be a good way to measure for that, to get that clearance for the calf when you bend your knee and where you position your uh, foot plate. Um, and again, it will risk decreased extra pressure on those front casters, feeling tippy, um, and have improved rollability. Um, back support and back angle. Um, very important because obviously these can really impact how you feel balanced, how much upper mobility of your arms and shoulders and head and neck are positioned. So when we talk about back height, it's actually from the seat frame to the top of that back post. Um, and when we talk about the back angle, we're actually talking about the, whether that back height is moved like angled forward, or we call that usually a closed position because the angle is less than 90 degrees, or is it been opened up? So now it's sort of extended back, and now we call that more an open angle, and it's usually greater than 90 degrees. That bank angle and height are really going to be very specific to that individual, depending upon whether you may be a higher uh, cervical injury or maybe you're a lower thoracic and you don't need as much stability, is going to impact um, where that seat height is, where it hits you on your back, whether you need it to come up to your scapula or above, or whether it can be lower and just in your lower lumbar area to support your pelvis and lower spine, and you have good control of your trunk. Um, so it really depends on the presentation of the individual. 
Um, obviously, someone who's a new injury versus someone who's been um, using a chair for longer. Um, and post-injury, it may impact, obviously, the height as well as the angle. Um, I just bring up, I like this little skeleton slide, just because it really shows the effect of um, different curvatures of the spine and how that may impact not only the length of the seat, but also the height and angle of that back. So again, whether someone is flexible in their spine, do they have more like normal curvature like this middle position where again, depending upon the level of injury, you can support those curves, but again, depending on what level, they may need it lower or they may need it higher um, for support and what angle. Um, you know, again, are these curves flexible? So if you give this person with the spine on the left support, can they come into a more normal stacked position like we see here in the middle? Um, or maybe someone has a real pronounced lordotic curve and they extend backwards. You know, again, where that back's gonna hit them, what kind of back, maybe they need to have increased lumbar cushioning or support or air or foam added to fill that in, it really depends on that individual and if it's flexible um, or whether we need to accommodate for some of that um, lack of flexibility. Um, back support height, again, we have our Goldilocks, which if it's too high, um, possibly could interfere with your scapula, which is going to limit your movement of your shoulder and your upper body for not only propelling, but also for maybe reaching back for a backpack. Maybe it's putting your clothing on um, or washing your hair. Um, too low, it may decrease, again, may not be enough support. And you may feel like you're constantly sliding and your um, pelvis or your lower body is sort of rounding out and tilted backwards, what we call the posterior pelvic tilt. And then all of a sudden now your posture now is collapsed. You're not breathing as well. You may have skin issues. Um, and now your posture is your head is forward, shoulders are forward. So it has changed how you propel and sit. Um, what's just right? As you can see this, this individual in the chair on, in the picture, you know, he tends to be um, uh, most likely a thoracic injury. And he has support through his uh, lower spine below the scapula and shoulder area to give again that flexibility of movement, but enough stability that he feels balanced so, and has good alignment with his wheelchair, his wheel, his cushion, everything um, to again, maximize function. Um, you know, do you feel stable? Back support angles. So as you can see here on the picture on the right, we have one that hatch is showing a little more closed. So again, that angle of the back has been brought forward and is less than 90 degrees. Depending on how someone wants to sit, and we'll talk about a little bit seat slope, the angle of the frame in the front is higher than the back in this picture. It, you can see how tight that angle becomes if you increase that back angle and you close it down, um, which can, again, may cause someone to not fit properly if they can't fit in this tight angle and cause them to slide forward in order to gain that support and balance. In the middle picture, you can see here where the back support has been what we call opened up or in a slight recline. Again, depending upon where you're seat to floor height in the back and front are, the slope of the seat, it's going to impact this angle, as you can see here, because when it's angled back, if a person was sitting in this chair, you most likely would see them reclining back. And again, that may cause the person to sort of round out and sit with a posture where they're trying to basically work against that angle backwards. Um, in order to get the balance and be able to push effectively. So again, finding that, that sweet spot for balance and performance is really important. And we get to our goalie thoughts, what's just right? Um, again, it depends on the individual, depends on that level of injury, 
um, how much support, um, but that angle needs to be able to support whichever back you decide, whether it's upholstery, whether it's a solid back, and again, how you set up this frame to give you that balance and be able to fit those hips in whichever angle you've created for sitting now. Um, again, there's nothing worse in my mind, but you can obviously tell me as end users to feel like you're constantly repositioning yourself because you can't get back in that seat enough. And now you're constantly sliding forward. Um, not good for skin, not good for function, not good for balance. Um, so things that you want to think about. Um, back support style. So we talked about height, um, but this picture helps to really show the <clears throat> differences between here's upholstery on the left-hand side and a solid lower back on the right. Um, you know, again, pros and cons to both. I'm not here to say one is necessarily better than the other, it depends on the individual. However, there are pros and cons to both. Um, depending on the height, the angle of the chair, how your wheelchair is set up is going to impact how one may um, feel or function better for you for balance and support. Um, however, I will say there are some general considerations. Um, fabric or a sling upholstery like this one here, it will be lighter weight. Um, it does, however, stretch because of the material over time, which may be an issue or may not. Um, sometimes you can get what we call the adjustable tension upholstery, which actually are straps underneath this piece here that you can tighten to increase those support levels, as well as if it stretches over time, make it a little more taut. Um, and again, some people like the feeling of a little bit of a sling here when they're sitting back into the chair. It really depends on the individual. It can also be more accommodating when we talked about that, again, angle when you're sitting with that back forward, open or closed, it can be more I'll say forgiving because it is material that you can feel like you can sink back into it um, versus a rigid back like we see on the right. Um, some of the, again, pros and cons of a rigid back, because it is a, a rigid back with a padded front piece, it is going to give you that solid support and improve positioning to be more stable. Um, it can result in better push stroke because now you're getting that support at your trunk and pelvis to help sort of hold you in place without a lot of extra, I'll say, movement there. Um, so again, it makes it more efficient then for your upper body uh, to work a little harder um, without you sort of moving around in that flexible um, sling upholstery. Um, again, the appropriate height is going to be imperative. Um, because again, it can be limiting, either one can be limiting if it's not at the right height for that user. Um, configuration matters. So you can see in this picture, this individual, and it's purposely in slow-mo so I can sort of talk as we're watching, um, and I, hopefully it's playing for everyone, but you can see it's the same individual, two different chairs. The one on the right is a good chair. Um, it does fit him. However, the one on the left is really a better fit. And why is it a better fit? Um, again, differences you can see between the um, upholstery versus the solid back. You can see the width and the taper is different. You can really see the difference in the arm position over the wheel and how much less he has to reach out to get to that rim. Um, it makes a huge difference then in how that person is pushing and the effect. Is it more efficient and safe? Um, again, this is the person on the left. You can see it's much less effort. Um, it's also in much better alignment. Um, again, you know, would he develop shoulder injuries? I don't know offhand, but if I had to choose a setup that was better, that was going to be least restrictive, it would be this one on the left. Also, you can see the overall width of the chair is smaller and it does obviously fit his hip width, but it also is now gonna be much smaller footprint wise for turning, getting through doorways, in and out of a car, 
loading those pieces of frame maybe into um, into a car if he's self-loading and taking it apart. So again, there's um, pros and cons to how you set it up and efficiency. Um, front frame angle. So this one is taking- Hey, Heather. Yeah. Excuse me for a second. I just wanna um, point out, we've got some really great questions coming in and some people have great. noted that they've left some questions with um, Heather and it's noon. And I know we've got some, um, oh, okay. a lot of stuff to content. So I just wanted to let you know great. that kind of where okay. we're at and we've got a lot of a lot of good questions to come up with at the end, I think. Okay, so let me just, I'll get through a few more of these quick uh, measurements. I won't talk too much so we can get to some questions, but frame angle, looking at that front, front frame as it comes down from the bend to the floor. Um, and I'll move forward again, a tighter angle generally tends to be a smaller overall footprint, but there can be very small, subtle differences in the angles that can make a big difference. Um, just to show quickly this frame angle um, between, you can see a huge difference between the 90 degree bend versus a 70 degree bend. Um, there's no wrong bend. It just depends on the individual and the best placement for their lower extremities, depending on maybe spasticity, contractures, uh, previous injuries, um, amputations, um, things like that can really um, depend on again, make that difference for where you wanna keep those legs to be positioned. But you can see the tighter the angle, so like the 90 degree angle, the closer it is to the frame, the greater knee bend you're gonna knee and ankle range to get those legs underneath that frame that much. So it depends on what you can tolerate and position with. Um, going, this one is showing two setups, basically, set up one and two. And basically what it's showing is the difference between that front frame angle. Um, this one on the left, you can see her legs are more in extended position. Again, it's not wrong or right. It depends on the individual where this one on the far right is tucked more under, her legs are bent more. But again, there's the smaller frame and footprint because the legs are tucked under. But again, the seat depth and frame depth may be different depending on how you're gonna position your legs. Um, a little quick one on front seat to floor height. So we measure seat to floor height, floor height, measuring from the frame to the ground and the frame to where that foot plate is or, or the bottom of your foot. Um, and basically looking at Just move this up. Okay, so now we've got this. So I'll go back just a slide or two. I don't know if we, um, I know we have some, this one really, again, center of gravity is just so important. And if it's something that some of you did adjust, maybe when you first got the chair, it is something to take a look at and possibly readjust um, as you're using your chair. So it is, again, depending upon how you want your chair to perform, the position of your axle, the center of the wheel, can be moved forward or back, up and down. And again, it maximizes performance if you're in good alignment, like I show with my yellow star, um, with the shoulder, the arm, and where it falls on the rim and the um, center of that wheel. So again, if it's too far forward, it can feel like the chair is very tippy. If it's too far back, it can seem like you're working really hard and it takes a lot more effort to maneuver. Um, but again, center of gravity um, and axle position, I would recommend everyone to really uh, take a close look at that. Hey, um, Heather. Yeah. We have a question about um, women's center of gravity. Is a woman's center of gravity different than a man's? Um, it can be, um, depending upon, again, where that weight is and the, you know, again, the size of that person. Um, it can, um, again, also depending upon women tend to, to carry a lot of weight in their sort of hips and I'll say a little behind area at times. Um, so again, how that chair is gonna be measured and then where that wheel is to, to again, how that person feels like they're, they're balanced is gonna be really important. So it, it, I don't think it's necessarily a man, a, a, a male or female thing. It really just depends on sort of your body type and performance. Um, Melissa, I don't know if you want to say anything. No, I'm, I think that's a, a great summary to that. Okay. Uh, this picture I just threw in because I really think it's a great example of someone who is 
positioned well with her axle, not only the height, but the from front, um, front of the chair and back of the chair and to the ground, but also moved forward and back. And you can see he's probably a good at least two inches with the axle forward. So if he were to put his arm down, it most likely that middle finger would be here. You can see the angle of the arm is optimal. And again, the configuration of his seat depth and frame depth really meet his measurements and where he's gonna position and angle his leg. So I really like this one because it brings everything together to really show a well-configured, highly op operable um, and optimal configuration. Um, I want to do this quickly. I know we're getting down to time, but seat slope. So it's the angle of the frame from Heather? front to back. Yeah. Heather, I'm so sorry to interrupt. Um, I, if you all have an, a little bit of extra time, I didn't realize that it was actually advertised in the newsletter as until one. So oh. um, if you have extra time, we Great. do have a little extra time. And okay. um, like I said, two people can come and go as they need to. Okay. Um, uh, I'm going to be monitoring people who come in, though. Sure, sure. sure. <laughs> but no um, but yeah, oh, and then I don't rush you, too much. I hopefully everyone then has a little extra time, more than twelve thirty. That's great. Yes, and if okay. you they do need to leave, please everybody, if you do need to leave, um, feel free to email them. They're, both of their emails are in the chat um, as well. So sure. just wanted to. I'm sorry to interrupt again. No, no, no problem. Sure. We should probably looking at the slides that I've left. We'll probably be at sort of questions by twelve thirty. So if that helps everyone um to get through this material um so seat slope um so again it increases the wheel access increases the balance and ultimately sort of that function of that upper body and what someone can do um this picture is showing more of a traditional seat slope which is basically a different angle from front to back um or seat to floor height as you can see this seat to floor height in the back is lower than the front. So the angle of the seat frame has to accommodate that and match it. Um, again, what this is showing is a little bit of the angle. As you drop the back of the frame, you're going to need to adjust your backrest angle and level of support in order to make sure that this person can sit into the chair. Um, what happens a lot of times is again, that seat angle gets to be tighter, the lower or the greater that slope is in the back um, to the floor. Also, the tendency of the client is to slide forward. If it gets too tight, you just physically can't get your body into that, into that angle, into that, that area open between that cushion and backrest. And secondly, it again, if it's too tight a position, it's going to cause someone to then really round out in order to try to fit. And what does that do? Again, it's now you're finding that you're sliding all the time when you try to propel yourself because your body just isn't getting that support and getting that benefit of being into that angle and seat. So what can you do? Well, in a lot of situations, if you're looking at a new chair, you may think about going what we call the ergo seat. The only one right now on the market is the tie light manual wheelchair. Um, they come in aluminum and titanium, but they will give you what we call this ergo seat, which you can see on this picture is actually a leveling out at the bottom height um, that allows, if you think about it, when you're, your sit bones and tailbone, when you're sitting on a cushion, tends to be lower than where your leg bone is. So this gives that sort of ability to sit into the frame without closing that angle down. Um, so for a lot of people, they can still get that really nice seat slope, but without that closed angle pushing them forward and rounding them out. Um, so again, it keeps everything supported, well-balanced, good alignment. So something to think about. Again, whether you have more of a classic frame or an ergo frame, Again, both can be configured and set up so you have proper positioning. I'm not saying one necessarily is better than the other, but when you're looking at performance and again, how someone wants to be positioned and depending upon how much slope you want, this may be better for someone who wants something more aggressive. Um, so it's something to think about. Um, the fit and function relationship. So again, what does it mean? 
not it doesn't mean that just because you have a, a significant seat slope without an ergo seat that you're necessarily going to be in a poor position. However, if you are someone who goes for a more aggressive seat slope or differential between the front and back frame to the ground, you will be positioned better and be more stable with an ergo seat. So if that makes sense. Melissa, any thoughts? Yeah, I am. Um, I, I love this topic. And Mary, I'm so excited to hear your feedback. Um, I think ergo frames are, um, so we, we can do an ergo seat on an aluminum or a titanium chair. Um, and it's not new. We've actually had it for a long time, but it is something that I think is less frequently known about or talked about. Um, and so just like all of this, it's important for you guys to know, to kind of ask and, and advocate and kind of help with that moving forward. And I think when you look at this ergo frame, um, that depth, like how far that measurement is for the, um, the flat part where you're, you're yeah, like this part here. It, yeah. Um, we custom measure that that's so it's in clinic. We look at you and we measure like how much space is needed because everyone's body and their pelvis, the way they sit and the way they kind of slope, um, the guy on the right here in this picture, that's a neutral pelvis. But if somebody has been sitting in a chair, um, for a long period of time and their body has kind of changed postures and they're more enough, uh, they're less flexible and their pelvis is kind of rolled like that person on the left, you might need a longer ergo seat than somebody else. We look at that to really lock you in and measure. Um, there are some demos floating around so you, someone can do a quick trial um, in, a, in a clinic to kind of see what that feels like. Um, and there's, again, it's it, like Heather said, it's not a right or wrong, but sometimes for new chairs, this is a really great start because it kind of sets you up um, anatomically. Uh, as your body's changing after injury to maintaining that best posture. Um, and if someone's been in a chair for a long time and they've had the same seat slope for X number of years, um, someone might not like this because their body's used to this position. Um, they know how to be functional and independent based on their current alignment. So um, definitely pros and cons, but I think it's absolutely a really great conversation piece and something to know um, that is exi does exist and is a great option. Yeah. Um, so we're actually at the end. So the key takeaways. So as we've been mentioning throughout the um, presentation, definitely config configuration matters. We know there's evidence and research. Um, we know from just clinicians and end users that yes, there's a there's a great impact on your ability to do what you want to do every day, all day long when you have a chair that fits you. Um, so again, looking at fit and why. Again, the configuration matters, the fit, how you propel and how effectively and safely um, the function. Again, the configuration is going is an extension of you. So it's going to extend how long you can use it, where you can use it, how you can use it. Um, you know, whether it's just ADLs in your home or maybe it's a combination of home and activities at work and, and for play. Um, and again, your independence ultimately, you know, we're trying to make that person be as functional, as independent as they would be um, and give them that freedom. So the chair needs to be an extension to them and, and make that um, fit that puzzle piece. Um, so again, remembering really the only acceptable wheelchair for someone who's using a wheelchair as their main means of mobility is really that chair that's highly customized and it keeps that that individual as the center, um, as what they want to use it and do with it. Um, so keeping it durable, light, configurable, um, all those things that we looked on that graph earlier um, to really keep that function. So at this point, we'll bring it to questions. And it sounds like there's been quite a few, um, which some we've been addressing uh, during the presentation, but. I'm happy to, Melissa, you want to sort of spark discussion. Yeah, um, really great question. So question about, um, uh, if, question uh, specifically, Alan and Pam have asked a kind of good question, jumping to sort of the, I'll say it's an important conversation. Um, and there's sort of not a right answer necessarily. And I'd be curious to see what you guys have experienced in, in kind of different locations. Um, so I'll, I'll jump to this right now, but if there's other, um, Heather Wood, I know Ryan said he sent you a list of questions, so feel free to um, come off mute in a second and, and kind of go through those. Um, and anyone else too, we can certainly open discussion, come off mute and chat, chit chat for a bit here and, and make sure we're answering your questions. And I think, um, 
um, who I'm not sure what this one gave me a second to look at this long question here. Um, so a couple of people have asked the question of how do I know, how can I pick a clinic when I'm being measured for a chair where somebody is, is skilled and has this ability to really um, fine tune it and more particularly where in the area is that? And, and frankly, there's, um, I think that is a good question and there's maybe not a right or a wrong answer. Um, I'll, I will say as, a, as resources, you know, Heather, myself, Perambil, and the Perambil team, our goal, like we try to get out and educate therapists as best as we can. We, um, we educate ATPs as best we can. We wanna educate the end users. So actually again, Heather Wood, thanks for having us here because we think this is so key to that. Um, and there are definitely, you know, Spalding's outpatient clinic, um, has a lot of this experience and does these measurements. Um, there is a outpatient clinic at Leahy in Burlington. Um, uh, Rhode Island Hospital in Providence. Um, there's a lot of clinics. Um, Spalding in Plymouth has an outpatient where there's a different therapist down there. I think um, for some of these one, I don't have, I, I, I think the short answer truly is I don't have a list to give you of that right now. If you are interested in a tie light chair or looking at these measurements specifically for the person who asked, can you request us to be at a, at a session? The short answer is yes, you definitely can. Um, and, or we can meet with your therapist. If you guys are currently in outpatient therapy for whatever reason, um, we can come to a therapy session, work with your individual therapist and help talk <laughs> about different options there. Um, because giving you access to this stuff is important so you can understand. And we're happy to spend time offline doing one-on-one -on -one education as well. Um, but at the, because the wheelchair process, and, and you guys all know this as well as anybody, it's a group between your ATP, right? Your, um, your dealer, your provider network, which is new motion or NSM. And they're ultimately the one that's measuring the chair and doing, um, they're the ones that have to take the measurements, but it's based on your decision. You know, so it should be a team conversation and then the therapist. So therapist, ATP and you. Um, and then if we're involved, we can be involved. Um, if they're not keeping you at the center and asking you what you want to do with your chair, how you want your chair to work, and they're not sort of explaining these parts to you, I find that then, you know what, you may not be at the best place because you definitely want to be at the center of this. And I think having an educated consumer is the best consumer. So definitely, you know, be your own advocate. And I think that the one of the challenging parts is there are a couple of people have made the comment of like the first chair. Um, there was a question of, well, when my first chair is is not great and I need a new chair in a year or two years, that um, unfortunately we hear that a lot and that's not awesome and we totally get that. And unfortunately, we know insurance has got this five-year five year rule where um, they're not going to pay for a new chair in five years unless there's been some some significant change in medical hist uh, medical presentation. And so the best that we can do is get out and educate and provide the education to the therapist, to the ATPs. Um, and to answer that question, ATP stands for assistive technology professional. The ATP is the person from, um, well, Heather and I both have our ATPs. So yeah. you can be a clinician or a dealer to have an ATP, but in this exact example of conversation, it's your therapist and then the new motion or NSM, that person at new motion or NSM, that is your, um, your dealer is the ATP in the equation, but often your therapist may be too. A therapist that specializes in this probably uh, may have their ATP. Um, and I think I just got distracted with my own train of thought is what I was talking about there. But who's sort of part of that team who has to be yeah. work together with you? Yeah. Oh, so when you when you have that chair at one or two years, like, unfortunately, that's where um, you can't get like, you can't go in through I don't want to say you can't, I hate telling anybody you can't do something, but insurance largely is not going to pay for it. And so that's where you go back to your dealer and ask about what other options exist. Are there modifications? If your chair was too narrow, can we widen it? The problem is you can't make an 18 wide frame for an adult. You cannot make an 18 wide frame, now a 16 wide. You just, that, that becomes a new frame. And you can, um, especially with your rigid chairs. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. And so um, you can, dealers can, get some new frame modifications and make some changes, but giving your specific chair, your specific age, your chair, um, whatever your modification need is, that's a one-off. So you'd go back to clinic and you'd meet with your with that group again, that therapist and that ATP and say, here's my new need. I want something different. Um, if we're like, I don't want to, if insurance, getting a chair through insurance at year two is not an option, I'd love to hear what you guys have done. Um, but I know there is an avenue if, if any out of pocket, um, if you guys have the ability to get an extra chair, 
um, some people, while this is absolutely not feasible for, for a large number of people, um, some people will purchase a second, like a used chair, like a demo chair. We have chairs that we use for teaching and demos and that existed. And so sometimes I've had people contact and say, hey, I'm looking for a new chair that I want to be 15 by 16. What do you have? Um, and you still buy it through your dealer, but you're buying a used chair for a different, uh, for a different reason. Maybe it's just to have because you need a new fit or it's because a different, you know, you need one upstairs of the house or at your other home or whatever. Um, so I hope that that's not a great answer and I recognize that, um, but I'd be curious what you guys think or, or if you have other, other questions you wanna add there. Yeah. Eric, nice to see you again. It's been a, been a year, but good to see you, what's up? Yes, I see you too. So I just wanna add to what, what you're saying. Um, so in my opinion, from what I've seen that, that pretty much 50% of wheelchair users, you know, their, their chair doesn't fit them. Um, and, you know, just throwing that number out. And what I think, and I think everything that you guys have presented, great, totally agree with. Um, one thing I think is missing is, is the psychology of why so many people are sitting in chairs that don't fit them. And, you know, looking at it from the, the wheelchair user's perspective, I think that they, a lot of new, newly injured or, or not so, think that when they sit in a chair that is actually optimum, it will be comfortable. And what they don't recognize is um, that that optimum, th that they need to develop their skill and balancing ability and posture so that when they do sit in the optimum chair, um, they'll enjoy it. So what I mean is a lot of people slump in their chair because it's actually more comfortable. Sure, more comfortable sure. Yeah, because they're, I'm sorry, go ahead. I totally get that. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, but the but I guess what I'm saying is I don't think that most wheelchairs recognize that they're slumping for a reason. They're slumping because they're afraid of falling forward. So they so mm -hmm. they get in all these positions yeah. um, that feel more comfortable, but they're really ineffective. But mm -hmm. but so when you put them in the chair that actually works for them, they're like, I don't like this. I don't yeah. feel stable. But you know it's right for them, but they know it's wrong. So they're the kind of their own worst enemy. And they don't recognize that that it's a progression. So the, uh, getting back to what Melissa was talking about, you know, how do you get people to recognize that how they are at time A is going to be different than time C? And that I think is an important understanding. So when they say, I don't like it, what you're really saying is, well, you don't like it right now, but that doesn't mean you won't like it later on when you get better at using a chair. Yeah. yeah. So Good. how do you address that? I think, I think that continuum of care, that continuum of change is really important. Um, and I, I think you're right. It's not stressed enough from, like you said, the end user's perspective. Like I think of the old pair of sneakers you've worn or you've been in and it's just gotten comfortable and you've broken them in. And now someone's trying to introduce something that's better for you. But it, it, it's sort of that it conflicts. Right. Right. Right, exactly. And I, I think that's a huge battle. And I, I don't think in general, it gets addressed. And I, I don't know what the solution is. I'm just saying mm -hmm. that I, I, it, it's a problem. I think mm -hmm. that what you guys are doing is great because you're making you're, you're, you're making a point of how important fit is. Mm -hmm. But you've got people you know, who clients who don't, un, I mean, they literally don't know what they don't know. They don't know what a good fitting chair is and they don't know what it's like to be highly maneuverable in a chair. So they think everything sucks. It's supposed to suck. It's supposed to do this, you know, and they're going for comfort as in couch comfort, as opposed to performance. Yeah, um, it's, it's just a tough battle. It is. And I think, I think most particularly it's so tough when it's your first chair and you're still understanding what being paralyzed means and what um, all that whole picture. And I know that's a struggle that um, therapists and clinics have. Warren, what, um, go for it, Warren. Actually, I was just gonna comment a little bit on what Eric said. Um, I've been injured for six years. And when I came back to the US, I did not have a chair and I'm covered by Medicare. So I had somebody come to the house because uh, my friends happened to have a chair that their elderly aunt used before she passed away. And so the person who came, um, I vaguely recall them doing one or two measurements, not asking me hardly any questions at all. 
and then my wheelchair showed up like a week later. Um, and looking at all the things you presented, um, they didn't really consider any of those things at all, um, yeah. I think. So I've basically been in that chair now for five years. And I've kind of gotten, quote, used to using that chair, although it's, it's clunky and it's heavy for my friends to carry up and down the stairs and mm -hmm. everything else. And I've taken the sides off of it because it fits more comfortable with the sides off of it and everything else. I didn't realize there were so many aspects to consider for a chair. I just really had no insight to all of that. So I appreciate you going yeah. over all of yeah. that. Oh, and I think going back to Eric's point, I, I think a lot of time there just isn't that education piece, whether you're ready for it, you're not ready for it, where you are in that process, that continuum of, of growth and change. And, um, and I think if anything, in this day and age, which is great, there's technology and there's like sources and places like this that you can learn more and, and, and be that educated consumer. But I think it, it is tough and where you are in that continuum and, and what someone's told you, what you've heard, it's tough figuring it out, definitely. Yeah. So one of the things, oh. the whole thing is being from like the Worcester area, now trying to find some place where there is basically what the ATP person that you can work with um, to pick out a chair that would accommodate me. So that's step two, I guess. So. Yeah. Yeah. Well, thanks. And I think one of the conversation one one point is um some of the like the stuff Heather presented is stuff that often the people that are experienced know intrinsically like they're doing it in clinics so it might be stuff that um, I certainly don't want to say people aren't considering this right like they might be considering it and they're just not verbalizing it because it's what they do all the time every day and they're quick and you're moving through sessions and stuff so a question could be um, to them when you're in when you're in an accentuated situation what do you think is my best seat to floor height or here's here's what I need um so is my seat to floor height the best for me or something like that um because just because it's not being yeah. said doesn't mean it's not being considered you know Consider. but of course every every situation every clinic will be different Heather sorry go ahead yeah no I just gonna say again to try to be educated to ask those questions so someone can verbalize and you can have that discussion um as to what you know again where you are in the process and what's going to be best for you again be able to discuss it you know so that again everyone's making those decisions but ultimately it's you um you know that makes that final decision it's your insurance usually covering it your money you know you should again my feeling is that you should feel that when you leave that clinic or whoever's or even at home care or whoever's doing that that prescription for you that you feel like when they leave you know why you chose what you did um, but that, that's my personal take on that. But. Mary. Yeah, hi. I Thank you for uh, coming out today. Um, I, I sort of disagree with what we just said, because I think a lot of times mm -hmm. we don't, as, as a user, we don't know. I mean, you guys definitely educated us today, but yeah. I, I have to tell you in a week, I won't remember what you said unless I took mm -hmm. copious notes, which did not happen. Sure. Um, and, and we have to rely on the, the professional and I've had, True. I've gone to one, uh, two seating clinics in 20 mm -hmm. years. And, um, one of them said, this is what you want. The guy spent the whole time on the phone, which was the deal or whatever. Mm -hmm. And then he comes in at the end and he just takes whatever the OT person did for measurements and the chair didn't fit immediately. And, um, and I, and I actually ended up buying my own chair and throwing mine in the trash can, what I had. I, I took what I could off of it, breaks and stuff like that, and threw it in the trash. I have a picture of it on the trash. Wow. wow. And, um, because we're, because we, I left thinking, oh, this, they are looking out for my best interest. And I honestly don't feel in this area. And I, I think if you read these horror stories that there aren't, and I do appreciate you guys are looking out for our best interest, but I think wow. the majority of the vendors are not. This is a personal opinion, but yeah, I value what you have to think because you're the ones that have been through the process. Yeah. And you, and if you do start 
and if for a person looking for that chair, I mean, the last chair I got, I mean, I'm, I sat in that chair and I'm like, oh my God, this is so nice. Immediately, mm -hmm. I'm like, this is a good chair, you know? And right. because the guy, you know, he came out to my house, he saw how I push, he saw how I live. He did, he brought the OT out to the house and he got in, um, I did, that's why I got the ergonomic frame. I'm a 20 oh, by 20. Did. I have long legs. Yeah. I have a 20 inch length. I have a, mm. I mean, I'm a long person. So, I mean, I got, that's what he was pushing for. And he explained to me, showed me pictures and everything. And I think that that's what we need to be honestly, every five or six years or whenever you get a chair, I just feel that they almost have to reteach us. But most people, if you talk to them, they just get the exact same chairs they got before because that's what they have they're sitting in. And, and technology is changing quickly. Right. You know, it's, it's amazing what's out there and how it changes year to year. So on that note, Mary, I agree in the sense of like relooking at reevaluating, you know, what's out there, what, what's best. But um, Mary, since you just commented about your ergo chair, your ergo frame, I love to hear how, how great that works for you. Um, there was a question in the chat about um, cushions on ergo. So sorry, we didn't think. Yeah, that was Ab time. Abby. I answered her. I just, um, oh, okay. when I first got it, they, they, they only, he had to cut, actually have to cut the, the uh, cushion. There's mm -hmm. very few cushions, unless this was four years ago. So hopefully there's more out there right now. Yes. So, so what, what we often recommend, um, a cushion that is flexible is going to be the best cushion to fit on an ergo frame. Um, because the idea is that the ergo is like the orthotic. The ergo frame is, is measured to your body. Um, the overall width of the frame, the depth, that amount, that length of ergo, whether it's six inches, seven inches, when I say length of ergo, I mean that length of the flat part. Um, and so that's contouring to your body. And so then the cushion ideally could provide the pressure relief. Um, so an air cushion is is the best one because there's there's no foam, you know, shaping the cushion. So you really just get the benefit of the um, of the frame. That said, um, what's super common, uh, not everybody can tolerate air. That's not the best option. So you can use um, a cushion that's flexible. And when you sit on it, your body will compress it. And then sometimes what we'll do often is we'll just do a thin score underneath. Um, you have to be able to be willing to do this and have your, your provider be willing to do this as well. Um, flip the cushion over. And then at the length of where that ergo is from where this happens, not that dramatic usually, but right here, you just do a thin score, like a quarter of an inch through the foam to kind of help facilitate that bend a little bit more. Um, generally like you're thick, if you have a really thick cushion, that's a solid, you know, four inches and really dense foam, that's probably not a good option for your ergo. So then we have to look at, goes back to the evaluation. What is your primary need? Is this cushion um, the priority or is the positional support and overall functional stability you're going to get from the ergo frame, the priority, and you're trialing a different cushion. And unfortunately, a lot of it will be, um, if, if you're in that spot, it's going to be trial and error and there might be some good decisions made or there's some some challenging things that'll come up um but that's uh those are your cushion options for sure why don't people push for the ergo frames why isn't that something that that's i don't know if people are not aware of it obviously we i wasn't aware of it so i got it but i mean is that something you guys not you guys but whoever when they i, I don't i don't think it's as widely known um even in for clinicians i i think sometimes you i don't think it's as widely known I've never heard of it before myself, and yeah. I've been paralyzed for a very long time. Never heard of it. Yeah. It's, a, it's, it's definitely something that is, is less known, and we're trying to get out and educate as, mu as much as we can. Um, yeah. Is Not there the an answer. insurance issue with coverage for the ERCO? Is there sorry, Alan, an okay. insurance issue? Like, is it is it more expensive? Is it harder to it get is, a coverage? Um, it's, it's an option, just like a lot of the things in your chair. So there is an option, there's a cost for it, um, but it's usually medically justifiable. Um, and so something that's just part of the LMN, um, it's insur uh, unfortunately insurance, it really is, you know, case by case situation. And so I wouldn't say it's, I'm not gonna tell you it's gonna definitely be covered, but it's absolutely something that should, if it's your need, it should absolutely be on your LMN and in your list of, of what's being applied. It does need to be justified. Mm -hmm. Yeah. But I, I haven't, I, in my experience in the clinic, I ran for 20 years. Again, if you're, if I'm justifying that ultra lightweight, high end customized chair, um, especially for someone with a spinal cord, I, in my time, I have not seen it difficult to justify, but.
Great. Good discussion. Any other uh, yeah. other questions or thoughts um, here? I think I got to everything in the um great in the clinic. There's a little bit of chat going on between a couple of people, so feel great. free to and Melissa, Heather has our emails, right? So if anyone yep. has any further questions or interests or if we can help direct anything. Um, yep, but, and uh, I put our emails in the chat as well. So you can email us both as well to kind of help navigate. Um, and, and we'll edit the videos <laughs> and get those out. Um, on well, YouTube. Well. And we took attendance today too. So if we have your email address, um, we can just send out the link um, with the recording of the video too, so. Great. Yeah. Yeah. Great. Thank, Thank you for all of your input. Thank you so questions. much. This was really, really helpful. Um, it's just such a common uh, topic of discussion. And um, sorry, you might see my cat ears <laughs> popping in here. She's like, oh, you're talking, mom. Let me come on to you. <laughs> um, but yeah, no, I really appreciate it. I think that we learned a lot today and um, just really appreciate your time. And thank you everyone again for for coming out today on Saturday and spending some of your time with us. And again, apologies for what happened in the first portion of this. Um, we are definitely learning as we go here, but I think I think we handled it. Um, I think that logging off and logging back in again was the answer. So, yeah. so thank you again. Anybody have any last, last questions before we log off for the day? I, I just asked for, um... Melissa just put her email in. Yep, I'm typing Heather's I, in right back. I missed the Heather, so yeah. if she yep. might put Popping that in right for you. Heather, can you just tell us again what's your what's your title and region? So I'm I am the uh, Permobile clinical educator. Um, I just came on board. I left the clinic that I've been running for about 20 years and just came on board to Permobile in November um, as their their clinical educator. My area is New England, and then um, like Westchester in New York, up through um, upstate and Western New York as well. Um, so covering, so working with um, Melissa and a couple other people that cover, you know, again, that New England, New York area to uh, help support them with education. And again, end users as well, so, so. Great, I love that you, both of you come with like the OT and PT ba background of, yeah approach. It's great. Yes. Yes. And I did see a UNH uh, sweatshirt or t-shirt on someone. I think it was Fred. Oh yeah. That's, my, that's my alma mater. So. Ah. <laughs> so. Awesome. Yeah. Great. Well, great. if nobody else has any other questions, um, you know, feel free to email Melissa and Heather um, individually. And um, thank you all again. We really appreciate it and hope to See you next month at our spinal source, which topic will be, um, is to be determined. We'll let you know as soon as possible. And uh, hopefully we'll see you at one of our groups this uh, upcoming week. Great. Thank you again for your Thank time. Thank you, everybody. Thanks, Thanks you. very much. Bye-bye.